Yeah, I, I remember a great deal about that time, the dark time. Yeah, I remember, I remember that day. Of course I remember the fucking birds. They were everywhere. Crows, yeah, yeah, I remember the crows. That was something else. Was there really a crow genocide? Bird murder. Uh, which is what they were doing. Oh god, just, they just, they put these birds in these piles. They're piled up just higher than the shit that piled up downtown, so got a lot of them. They were here way before we got here. And they tried to get rid of them. They tried to, they tried to wipe them out. The phenomena of the crows uh, congregating in Rochester, it's because it's a social thing. They don't have any family responsibilities. There's no nests, there's no youngins. So it's basically just the party crowd hanging out, doing their thing. And so they're also looking for mates and they're looking for groups to belong in before they mate. The crows call us back on The birds were just something to behold. Birds have been on this planet, Miss Daniel, since Archaeopteryx, 140 million years ago. Oh, crows. Crows are very smart. Smarter than most people think. The crow is a permanent resident throughout its range. Hyper-intelligent birds. Smarter than some people, in fact. People that I know are dumber than crows. Birds are not aggressive creatures, Miss. They bring beauty into the world. It is mankind's yeah. right. And birds do well. I'm no scientist. I hope you guys got a scientist to interview. It is mankind, rather, who insists upon making it difficult for life to exist upon this planet. They just cover buildings, trees, entire rooftops. It's the end of the world! So we got this scientist guy, and, uh, you know, he suggested a bunch of ways to help these crows get relocated, you know. The crows come at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon and hang out and they party and make a lot of noise and then they kind of settle down for the night, no big deal, but... <laughs> and then they come into the city at night to keep warm. The city comes through with a truck and makes, the truck projects really loud fake hawk noises and they put their arm out the truck and shoot like a... A racetrack gun, I guess, like a blank. So it sounds like a real gun, but it's not. So instead of just the crows, we get the crows, the gun, the fake hawk noises, and then every dog in the entire neighborhood starts to bark. So that's not exactly the best way to spend city money or time, but it's kind of entertaining. We're fighting a war, Sam. A war against who? Against birds. I'm glad you all think this is so amusing. Like they're smart enough to know that they are being followed and that somebody else can skin out smart them so they... They tried, they tried uh, loud noises. Uh... And then they were trying to blast them with lasers. And then they just decided to murder him. And they thought it would be much easier to just murder all of the crows, shoot them with guns. Barbaric. Good, ain't no good eating, so it was just kind of a waste, but you know, we took care of them. That's it. It was a good hunt. And they didn't even eat him? What? What? What does a crow taste like? Have you ever had crow? There's just too many of them. How do we take care of them? That's the question. We don't want them here. They shouldn't be here. They don't belong here. We just gotta get rid of them. Any means possible at this point. You know, you've seen the lasers, you've seen the, the weaky deek noises. It ain't doing nothing. It ain't doing nothing. We gotta get out there, get some sort of traps or poisons 
or just clear out downtown. Let's get a day of buckshot out there. They're super smart, so we have to be smarter than that. And just sort of bullying them or pretending with guns isn't going to work, so. I can demonstrate if you'd like. Uh, I, this is one of the ways uh, we could record this and play this back for the birds so they would uh, try to leave. Uh, because they hate this. They hate this very much when you go... Crows hate that. So the one way that they attract um, friends and comrades is by sharing a food source. Crows are known to exhibit problem-solving skills, facial recognition, mathematical abilities. Uh, a crow once helped me finish a crossword puzzle. The range is unbelievable for most people. No, I'm not a bird cop. And their feathers are really beautiful. They're, they even have like a little bit of a purple tinge to them. Oh, this is one of my favorites. It also, what's interesting is they're considered songbirds. They're part of the corvid family. And um, they each have a different sound. Even though we, they sound the same to us, each one, like in your family, you each person has their own sound. So they all have a different sound for their name. And they've also shown that there's different dialects, like the crows on the West Coast sound different than the crows in the Midwest. It's a natural progression. You know, you go from sampling, you know, like water and, and wind. You know, and before soon you start noticing that like sound creeping into your recordings and, and called to me. You know, so I'm kind of going for like on this new project, going for kind of a more uh, aggressive punk angle, you know? And like that, when you can get that. Uh, yeah, there you go. I've been trying to get different time samples. I'm trying to get samples of local crows in the area and I'm trying to get their different sounds of day because at night they kind of have this more aggressive tone because they think they are out they're out to party it's trying to capture that sound underground crow scene you can start hearing they have some very unique songs to the rochester environment and i've been out here kind of sampling i'm trying to find inspiration for my next project so i'm sure in your little document you have lots of people talking about how smart there but like what wasn't like they have some music right there yeah it's like it's like dubstep sound of that, you know, kind of, you just feel the attitude in there, you know, just kind of, yeah, yeah. I just like the way they sound. I actually wrote an article for uh, National Geographic magazine. Uh, it's not this issue, it wasn't actually published, uh, rejected, but I wrote it, I submitted it. Uh, Crows like to wash their food before they eat it. Crows often um, band together um, if a bigger crow and older crow is picking on them. I think the funniest thing about about the crows is that. It, the, the same sort of behavior that they exhibit in order to survive and actually flourish, they're one of the only species recently that has really flourished, is that they've adapted to their environment in the same way that human beings do. You know, if there's not a good enough place, they'll find a place. They obviously come into the cities because we built buildings such that it, it protects them from the wind and the cold and it's fun and we leave food in dumpsters and food on the streets that they eat um, so they have plenty of food source it's a warm place to stay and I think it's sort of an irony or you know that 
we hate them for what we are known to do on this earth, right? You know, we figure out how to feed ourselves when there's not enough food or we just, somebody else suffers for it. And, you know, and I talked about the crows in my yard and how much I enjoy them. And I, I had one of my neighbors actually threaten me if I uh, ever fed them or encouraged them to come here. Like people got a little crazy. It's a little nutty. It is an ongoing fight that I see. And it's interesting because other communities have had the same problem and they sort of turned their lemons into lemonade. There was a local group from San Francisco that came down and uh, they were looking for some ways to engage the community with their public art initiative. And uh, the one spot that they focused on was the crow shit downtown. Oh, the crows in downtown Rochester. If you want white sidewalks, crows are your thing. They're gonna cover that sidewalk so full of white gold, you're not even gonna be able to walk through. You have to power wash the sidewalks if you don't want your shoes dirty. Employees couldn't walk in this shit. It was just, just defecation ground zero in the downtown area. It was awful. It might have been a sanitation hazard. I don't fucking know. And they were just, just shooting. And they were shooting. Every day I'm trying to get to my car, I get off work, and this fucking just, my car is covered in shit. It's insane. I can't pay for car washes every single day because there's shitting everywhere. It's a nightmare. bring her objects. They would reward her. Every time, they were just destroying everything. We took out the garbage, all these things. You're not going to believe them. Okay? So, one night, I come out of here because I, you know, I got to take out the garbage and stuff. And these effing crows, there was garbage everywhere. So, I'm vegan, and I'm like, you know what? I don't want to kill these creatures. We're probably in some way interfering in what they got going on. So what I decided to do was, I decided, you know what? If they're hungry, I'm gonna give them something to eat so they don't have to eat and destroy everything else. So, what I did was I left some food around here. Um, I left some food for them. So I, I, so I started leaving food for them, and I don't know if they, because they're birds, they got wonderful instincts or what, but then all of a sudden, they start leaving me gifts. So every time I come out here, I bring them a little bit of food, and then they bring me a gift. So today, I'm gonna see if they brought, if they left me any, oh! Today's gift, look at this, look at this. So today they left me a twig with a little bit of a, a little aluminum pop tab on top. I don't know if they're saying that we need to stop effing up the earth and recycle or not, but I got your gift, crows, and I'm so grateful. So, so tonight, I'm gonna leave them a little something extra, see if they leave me a little something extra. Gosh, I love these birds. Crows are incredible. You know, when I really think about it, timing is kind of a little bit of a coincidence. I mean, I'm no conspiracy theorist, but, you know, that uh, company coming in, developing our economy or whatever, same time these drones of crows come in, I mean, I don't know, I ain't no conspiracy theorist, but if you want to talk chemtrails, let's talk crow trails right now. They're coming in drones, uh, they're getting everybody sick. Let's talk about the water 
They're pooping in the water. I mean, help. Here in Rochester, we really love our birds and their poop. We've got the goose poop all over anywhere you're around water, and then crow poop when you're in trees. And uh, it's just part of life here in Rochester to be stepping around some sort of bird droppings. We're constantly paying people to clean up a shit, right? One of the risks with having a lot of the droppings is when it gets washed away off of the hard surfaces and into our waterways, um, that can actually add to the bacteria that is in the water. But the crows are like, we ain't gonna pay for people to clean up our shit. And they're like, no, no. That can be an issue for just watershed health. See those Canadian geese? No, they're gonna be a problem. And why, why are the Silver Lake geese, the Canadian honkers, why are they protected? Why weren't the crows protected? Why didn't the crows have civil rights in this fucking town? Where have I been? When there's too much poop concentrated in one area, the best for the birds and for the health of the uh, environment is to have those populations spread out throughout a region rather than concentrated in one area. The crows don't like their own poop and definitely don't walk under them at night. I mean, I like them, but I don't want to get pooped on either. They had a real big problem with the poop. And you know what happens when you have a problem with the poop? You just, you get rid of the prop, and that's what they tried to do. Wiped out? Wiped out? Are you, I'm sorry, wiped out. No, no. Shit, not my town. I'm not surprised. I have seen this kind of thing before from the people who live here. <clears throat> they, uh... They will never understand. <laughs> they will never understand the beauty and the elegance. Very interesting. They have extremely complex social relationships. And yet we just, I think just because of the pooping, really, people get really upset. I wonder if they sounded a little bit nicer. Maybe people wouldn't uh, be so upset about them or if they were more colorful. A cult is a very um, particular word. We are a group of people um, that meet every Tuesday night in the basement of the church on 2nd Street. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it just really started when I realized how magnificent of creatures these, these birds are. Uh, they are, are misunderstood in our society today. They just their intelligence, their physique, the, the wingspan is so large and, and free as they fly through the air elegantly. And we should all aspire to be such elegant beings. And that is, that is why I organized our passionate group of people dedicated to the worship and uh, appreciation of, of these birds. <laughs> You know, some people say that I'm an extreme environmental activist, but look at what we've been doing to the world we live in. Look at the way we cut down all of the trees and pave the roads and put garbage into the ocean. But the most importantly is we're ruining the home of what is perhaps the most superior life form on Earth. And we just cannot Regardless of whether or not you agree with me, which you should, you must not destroy their homes. We we don't belong here in the same way that they belong here. They they are the ones who belong. Ah, ah! All you have to do is blame yourself for this. Except for the select few of us who meet every Tuesday.
Have you in your life ever had that level of purpose? <coughs> the level of knowing exactly where you're going to go. <coughs> I'm finally beginning to see the meaning in in my own existence after following these these beings. <laughs> It usually works, it's just, <laughs> there are, they must be, uh, flying south or something. <laughs> they usually do come, though. It's the first day of 2019, probably like the coldest day all winter so far, so it's like pretty, uh, pretty intense art making right now. We're gonna see what happens pretty excited about what's gonna go down. I'm kind of fascinated with this idea of taking, you know, feathered feces and taking something that's kind of a nuisance and a pain, turn into something that's kind of interesting. So I got a canvas staked out down here and uh, got a camera on it. We're gonna be taking pictures at like five minute intervals, hoping to catch some great splatters from our, our black feathered friends here. Kind of see what happens over time. Right now I'm hoping that they're gonna, there's lots of poop underneath the tree, so thinking they're gonna show up here. Like one of the things that I'm interested in for this is kind of turning like the chaos of nature into something that's kind of interesting to appreciate and to see like the randomness of what's gonna happen when the, the crow poop just splatters. Just the idea of like poop as art, I think is kind of ridiculous. And this idea of turning something into a nuisance that needs to get cleaned up, turn it into something that you're gonna preserve and save on a canvas is an idea that I'm fascinated with. And, I don't know, we'll just see what happens. Maybe I'll get done with my four or five hour stint here and we'll have a blank canvas. Maybe I'll get done and there's gonna be like poop splattered over that whole thing. We had our first location here and the crows, despite all the poop on the ground, the crows did not seem to be in the tree. We scouted out another location a couple blocks over. It's gotta be about 100 crows up there. We gotta go where the poop is. So we're gonna head over there and try to get some poop going on. It's gonna be a pretty shitty night is what I'm hoping. That's what we're going for here. So we'll, we'll see if it turns out that way. We're coming up on uh, Central Park here. Got some hot drinks to keep us fortified on this cool night. And we're gonna make some poop painting happen here. Looks like these trees are like covered. There's gotta be like, I don't know, at least a hundred crows on these trees. We painted our canvas black and we're gonna set it down over here. There's gonna be like poop casso in action. It's gonna be amazing. Getting pooped on. I got some poop on my coat right there. That's terrible. Now, let's get him to poop on the canvas. I'm I'm moving away because I'm hearing poop dropping everywhere. Here. Sounds like if somebody's poop falling down, it sounds like rain. I'm seeing some a couple of splatters, nothing too ground shaking. I'm gonna check my phone, see if it's still recording here. Oh, it looks like it's still going. I got about 35% left on it, so I think I'm gonna keep letting it run for a while and but we definitely have some poop on the canvas finally not just on my my sleeve so it's kind of exciting to get some poop on the canvas the crows are maybe not letting me down tonight so I'm getting excited I'm just gonna let 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 shit happen here for a little bit So we're here late last night. We got the canvases laid out. Now it's time to see, uh, you know, what this murder of crows left behind for us. I think it's gonna be a pretty awesome apocalypse right over here. So let's see what we got going on. Oh, I'm getting, oh, it's looking good. 
bar is looking good. Oh, it's like, it's kind of like a, a crow space scene, I think. It looks like we've got some, some meteors and some planets, and it's all crow poop. This is like, uh, this is pretty incredible, actually. I'm kind of amazed. Let's see, here's another one. I gotta say, these are some creative crows. I mean, like, look at that uh, composition there. We've got some nice negative space and some excellent uh, range of textures and colors being used there. Some nice whites and browns highlighting things. I'm, you know, I'm really kind of curious about exactly how this swatch right here came to be like was it the crow zooming in for a landing and kind of like trailing some crow poo behind it or i don't really know how it worked but actually i'm really thrilled with both of these excellent pieces so very excited we're going to move on to our next location see what else we got for the the uh, crow poop lips here this one's a little bit a little bit different here uh this is the, the failed site of the uh, time lapse camera where the, the cold weather made the battery run down it didn't quite work uh, this was a canvas that I found painted like this downtown by a dumpster and which kind of spurred my whole idea for this uh, this one's a little more subtle uh, the, the crows weren't as weren't as uh, you know creatively poopy on this one as they were on, on the other ones but I'm kind of liking the subtlety of it it's a little I could I could totally see this like, hanging in a living room you know maybe with your your pink couch or something like that would be could be pretty awesome for that I think so I'm, you know, I'm pleased with this one too so far you know I think we're kind of kind of three for three because actually this would make a great a great poop triptych here I think kind of put this one right in the center oh this, this is pretty good I'm, I'm gonna get on Etsy here right away and get these on Etsy it's gonna be gonna be off the hook pro poop for everyone all right uh, this is our second crow poop art site we're gonna see what kind of a result that we have here uh, pretty, last night there's the murder of crows that was in these trees was had to be in the hundreds so I'm pretty interested to see how this one is going to turn out oh and it's looking, looking pretty good looking pretty good A nice uh, kind of complete speckling pattern, you know. It's very uh, abstract. I'm liking some some of the the squigglies that we get right here. Are very interesting. Some nice spatter effects on this one. Again, pretty textured overall. So I think this is a another another winner. Uh, it's not my favorite of the four so far, but I do like this one. So uh, another another win. Central Park. The, the crows in Central Park, they got some art in their blood, no doubt about it, for sure. This is the third of our three crow poop art sites, and coming up on this to kind of see uh, what it's going to look like. If the ground and the grass is any indication, it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty stellar stuff that we got here. All right, looks like we've got some pretty good cover on, on this one right here. Uh, maybe some uh, heavy grain diet going on in some of these uh, particular splatters, I think, but uh, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with this one. I'm liking how there's a little bit of a, a uh, central point here with some more action and like it's drawing your eye kind of through this line, so some good compositional, some good random compositional effects going on there. This is a smaller, a smaller canvas. Uh, we got some kind of, I like how there's some, some translucence in this particular area and more opaqueness over here. It's kind, of, kind of like the, this is like the, the ghostly poo and this is like Casper full fledged, fledged over here. So that's pretty, pretty good. I'm liking that one. This one, this one might be one of my favorites right here. Uh, this is, this might be the best of the six, perhaps. Uh, I'm really liking how we got a lot of 
line line actions, uh, some splatter patterns here. We have to get like a bird uh, expert, an avian expert, to kind of tell us how those were formed. But oh, this is really this is really nice. The the, the crows on North Broadway, by far the superior art makers, without a doubt. The this flock this flock of uh, crows here. Thumbs up. You get the Seaver's thumbs up. Superb piece here. Excellent. Can't wait to get the whole collection together now. You gotta be careful not to. We've had a successful art venture here. The crows have done their bit and they provided the poop for the canvases and they look beautiful. I'm, I couldn't be happier with how things turned out. My next step now is I gotta find a way to preserve these masterpieces. I'm thinking about a nice clear shellac varnish to put over the canvases to make sure that the, every little piece of poop stays in place so that nothing gets distorted or destroyed because I, I really want the creativity of the crows to live on in perpetuity and it's gonna be a, a beautiful thing for years to come. So, crow poop art was a success story and uh, I'm glad you're here with me to follow along the path of crow creativity in Rochester, Minnesota. Love the idea. It intrigued me. It made me wonder before I even knew what was going on. So I knew this was the kind of thing that would intrigue other people as well, especially people who were downtown and saw the canvas. I think that just kind of gets at a long time argument what really is art? And is art born out of chaos and nature? Or does it have to be deliberate? Does it have to be measured? Does it have to have a message? Or is the message something that the piece itself imbues on the viewer? That sort of conversation is as old as art itself, probably. And this was just that conversation, just carried with a little bit of a quirk that it was made with crow feces. You know, when we do stories about these crows in downtown, or when they return and people start to notice the mess and hear them in the trees, I don't think you find too many people who are neutral. It, it generates a lot of controversy, conversations, some arguments, and I don't think we have too many pieces that end up with people coming away neutral. It definitely is one of those ongoing stories that journalists reporting look at continuing to cover because it does polarize people, but I think there's still a lot to discover. There, there's a lot of conversations, both sides, things to explore about it. It's not a black and white issue, even if the canvas looks like it's just black canvas with white shit. We separate ourselves from nature and, and we feed our own delusions that we're something that is not chaotic, something that is not natural. We have these ordered systems. We move waste away from our homes and our lives and we don't see the byproducts. We don't see the results. And cities give us this safe delusion of order, cleanness, and in many ways I think the crows returning are, it can be a reminder that this isn't the reality. We might not see our sewage treatment plants, we might not see our, our landfills or our garbage incinerators, but we are messy, we are chaotic, and we are leaving signs of ourselves, maybe not underneath trees, but in a lot of other places on the planet. And the idea that we turn our eyes to the crows and say that they're dirtying our environment, our artificial environment, I think is a very narrow and kind of arrogant way to look at it. I don't think these were crows. But he has hundreds of them. I think we're a much bigger threat to a lot of ecosystems and the birds themselves than they are to us, even though it's kind of fun to have a scary movie in which these thousands of birds fill the sky. 
I don't really see them as a threat to us in any kind of existential way. The fact that they're here, they've come back to roost for a reason. They're not finding much food anywhere else in places that we've developed. The city is a fine place. It stays warm, is sloppy, and has a lot of food. That's just my opinion. Um, when I first saw the crows, they were all over, and my children were terrified. They, they, they perched all over the top, and at first we were worried that maybe they were just like, kind of poop on everybody. Um, but it turns out that crows are much more terrifying than that. They're big and they're black, and they just like created this cloud over us, and kind of whirl around in a circle. I just really don't like the crows. They're not great. They wake me up in the morning down. Crows versus um, the city or versus the downtown area is rather than saying it's working against the crows, is thinking about how can we work with the crows. Crows are pretty intelligent birds and a little bit of research into what their habitat uh, needs are. Maybe we can find some creative ways to naturally attract the crows. They're smart enough that if you feed them in a proper way, like you could just a little on the edge of town and, and make it a regular feeding, you can actually get them to move. But we've just tried to scare them or intimidate them or bully them. It sounds very much like a political climate that I'm aware of recently, but anyway, that's another story. And then the, the other thing, I you can tell that I read a lot about crows. <laughs> I'm sorry. So anyway, the other thing I thought was really cool, and I think it's also helped them expand, is they generally have four to six, uh, they lay four to six eggs. Crows are um, monogamous and they mate for life. I thought that was pretty interesting. The male crow woos the female crow with shiny objects. So last time we were here, we were talking about the cloaca, specifically that cloacal kiss that crows have when they have sex. But sometimes a crow doesn't always have sex with a live crow. It gets mistaken, and that's when we have crow necrophilia. Could you hit the lights for me, please? So crows are actually a lot more promiscuous than we give them on for. A lot of birds are monogamous, but and they mate for life, but crows will also have kind of cooperative breeding techniques that they do together, kind of a stay-at-home kid situation sometimes, or a third-party bird situation sometimes. But crows also will have times where they just go and have sex with other crows. And the cool thing about this is that when they store all of that sperm in their cloacal sacs and they copulate, you know, a bunch of eggs, sometimes one pile of eggs is actually like a couple dads worth of eggs. Uh, and on top of that, their weird breeding things, there are crows that will they'll see a dead crow, they get freaked out, they'll call for alarm and they'll be like, oh, oh no, oh God. And then they get so frenzied up and confused, they'll start just having sex with that dead crow. And then they'll tear the crow to shreds. Like they wouldn't leave a piece of the body at all. They'll just tear it all up. And I don't think scientists really understand. It's like it happens at about 4% of the time when they see it. They don't really understand if it's because they just like are in the middle the beginning of mating season or if it's because they are just like so confused and they just get all of their hormones get raging at the sight of a dead bird but sometimes crows will fuck other crows that are dead and that's okay all right are there any questions and then you'll see right around april is when they start courting and they and then they leave um, or they, you know, go with their mate and leave. And their nests are actually really hard to find. They're very secretive about their nests. They build pretty big nests. They build them every year, and they make them out of a very specific size of stick and shape, uh, like diameter and width. Um, they sort of make that sort of the, the under part, and then they fill it with softer stuff on the inside. <laughs> Oh, my God.
In fact, there's a scale that I created of dumbest to smartest birds. And there's a whole range in between of all the different kinds of birds. And I'm still working on it, rating the intelligence of birds. It's really quite fascinating. Crows and ravens are considered um, the smartest birds. Google it. They go and get free food in the cornfields and hang out all day. There's a lot of misunderstanding, too. I know that some people are shooting crows because they think that they eat um, like the corn in the fields, and they're a uh, nuisance to farmers, but that they, they don't do. It's nothing noteworthy. They don't eat enough to cause really any real damage, so. And then you'll see right around April is when they start courting. They're wildlife. They're, they're beautiful, and they fit in just like everybody else fits in. Like, you know, worms aren't great, but they're a part of the process, right? You know? So, and they eat stuff, like they pick the fruit that's dying off the trees, and they're kind of the scavenger. Like, they, they fit in. And just because they're a little loud, and I find them extremely entertaining. And they shouldn't be unnecessarily harmed, right? I mean... Why, why do we continue to feel that we have the right to determine their numbers? They have a, as much right to be here as, as anybody else. Oh, they can use tools. They learn to use tools. So this is Betty, she's a new Caledonian crow, and these crows use uh, sticks in the wild to get insects and whatnot out of pieces of wood. Here she's trying to get a piece of meat out of a tube, um, but the researchers had a, a problem, they messed up and left just a stick of wire in there. And uh, she hadn't had the opportunity to do this before, you see it wasn't working very well. So she adapted. And this is completely unprompted. She had never seen this done before. No one taught her to bend this into a hook. No one had shown her how it could happen. But she did it all on her own. So keep in mind that she's never seen this done. Right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so that's the part where the researchers freak out. Um, <laughs> There's a whole series of how all these animals and work together, and if we take them out of the mix, you know, it's important to have them in there. And there's this fallacy that they eat all, a lot of songbirds' eggs and so that they're bad for other birds, but that's not true. You know, as long as we continue to leave our food out and continue to ruin the habitat for them, then they're going to find the best habitat they can, and that's why they've moved into downtown. So maybe we need to think larger environmental picture of what's going on, because clearly this is a newer problem. So it's something that we have done. So maybe we need to think about that, that we've created our own problem that we're so mad about. Well, crows are very adaptable creatures. They can do well in a variety of places. But Rochester had a, a unique formula going for it of not too urban, but not too rural, a perfect breeding ground for crows. Well, Rochester is a lot more than just Mayo Clinic. It's multifaceted, it's not one dimensional. Mayo Clinic's an important part of it. I think somebody might have done a documentary on it, but they didn't mention anything about the crows. Yes, indeed, Rochester certainly picked an ideal location for a city. Beautiful, just simply beautiful valley, as if no adjectives in any language could compete with what nature has wrought here. Farms in the area are completely electrified now, of course, and as modern in all the conveniences of good living as the methods of farming the surrounding acreage. Industries have developed here that have made the name Rochester synonymous with quality and precision manufacturing. A veritable who's who in American business. Industrial pioneers. A tradition of fine craftsmanship developed here, attracting quality industries and quality people alike. Skilled industries, skilled people. Clean industries, clean people. Stable industries. Stable people. Diversified products, 
Not only those in present production, but those in the dream stage, those still swirling around in some inventive mind, demand an educated workforce, adaptable, swift to understand change and technological improvement. Change is necessary to keep competitive in industries as well as cities. If you don't change, change will change you. Technological lag is tantamount to slow death. Rochester recognized this fact years ago and developed a program of training and retraining the workforce. And again, not only to keep the workforce abreast of the times, but to keep it ahead of the times. There is a positive passion in people here for going to school. An incredibly contagious fervor, almost purer, to learn more than they know about everything possible. There is a profusion of educational facilities, graduate as well as undergraduate, developing diversified talents necessary to attract and hold diversified industries. Many of these institutions are generously endowed from the profits of local enterprise. Rochester's colleges attract people from all over the country, and they generally stay here. Industries, too. When you come right down to it, what brings a prospective industry to a prospective location? More than anything else, it is an enlightened workforce. In this respect, Rochester is second to none, for clean industries, that is, for industries requiring a high percentage of professional, technical, skilled, and semi-skilled personnel. Naturally, a prospective industry will have other requirements. Site zone for industry? Rochester has them. Industrial parks circling the city and right in the downtown area. Urban renewal and redevelopment at its best. Replacing the old with the new, within view of the heart of the city. Industries, of course, are citizens of the community, the same as individuals. And here, both are expected to be good citizens. In Rochester, parks are parks, industrial or otherwise. There's a tradition of greenery, sunlight, fresh air, and the sheer joy of open space. Flowers. I'm talking about the community compulsion to plant wherever there's a square foot of sod that can stand brightening. Truly, the entire population seems born with or converted to the green thumb. Flowers. Flowers. People here put down roots too, so it is no surprising statistic that 70% of the occupied dwelling units in the Rochester area are owner-occupied. A family city is Rochester. Doing things together is the order of the day. Signs of the past, historical markers in the towns and villages of the valley give further evidence of the building fervor in the early days of settlement. Old landmarks adapted to modern business ventures, and charmingly so. There's a gentle respect, place after place, for the architectural heritage of the valley, a tender reverence for previous periods the same as that afforded the sheltering shade trees. People here have made peace with the past, the same as they have with the natural setting of this area of the world. Old mansions are now museums. But don't let such historical preservation beguile you. People here can be tough, too. They can be tough with a tree when surgery is necessary. They can be tough with a tree. They can be tough with a house. They can be tough with a city when surgery is necessary. Tough, yet tender at the same time, in the manner of skilled professionals. 
There has never been any nonsense about the purpose of the city or the nine counties of the Rochester economic area. Quite simply, it is considered a place to make a profit as pleasantly as possible. The community is fully aware of the financial facts of life and the methods of making an economic area prosperous. The important thing, of course, is that the heart of the city has a booming beat, stronger than ever before. Times change, and you either change your city to fit them, or they'll change your city, often unpleasantly, more often unprofitably. Rochester has made its peace with the automobile. Is it practical to do otherwise? Does it make any civic sense whatsoever to cuss the tyranny of wheels and the insolent chariots instead of getting together to plan a workable solution for traffic congestion? 20th century America is geared to the automobile, and thus is Rochester geared. Traffic flows here, flows faster all the time because of community planning for the years ahead. Incidentally, there is one of the best traffic safety records here of any city in the country. Believe me, friend, if you're driving more these days and enjoying it less, come to Rochester. Here, driving is the positive pleasure it ought to be everywhere. What's more, there's plenty of convenient parking space, thanks to more community planning for the years ahead and the building of self-liquidating municipal parking units. It is not the least bit surprising, of course, to the people living here. They like good music, and they support good music, in the same manner, in the same spirit, that they achieve other community advantages. They get together a committee of conscientious citizens and raise the funds by popular subscription. Industries, as well as individuals, get behind the program and push, with the result of the cash, as well as the checks, comes rolling into the good cause. People here live and work in splendid harmony. Harmony and respect. Throughout the world, of course, Rochester is famed as a medical center. Hospitals, research laboratories, most of them supported by private funds, have pioneered many of the medical miracles of our time. Health insurance for an already healthy community and wonderfully reassuring to the senior citizens. Most of them stay here in their declining years. They love it here. They find plenty of satisfying activity to occupy their retirement. So it doesn't make much sense to them traipsing off someplace else. If necessary, of course, Rochester looks out for them. Such philosophy has produced enlightened government, working with enlightened commerce. In other words, public funds are used to spark and to supplement private enterprise. Such action has revitalized the heart of the city, more specifically, downtown Rochester. As in most American cities, the tendency here in recent years was a withdrawal from the central core to the surrounding suburbs. People first, then business, headed for the open spaces. Rochester didn't fight the suburbs or the shopping centers rising to meet suburban needs. It simply capitalized on the things people like about shopping centers. Wide varieties of merchandise, the fun of meeting people, and above all in this day and age, a place to park. Rochester Civic Center pulls together as many functions of city, county, state, and national government as possible into one location, with easy access, of course, and plenty of parking space. Having made its peace with the past, Rochester can rip out and rearrange streets and sections of that central core to its heart's content. Here is another section that will feel the impact of the bulldozer. Surgery, tough, yet tender. A complex of hotels and apartments, shops and offices, parks and promenades. Up, up, 
top the girders went. The framework for a new 18-story office building and hotel. The framework for a new retail complex centered about a new root air-conditioned marketplace the size of a football field. Dollars. Why would investors put up that kind of money for something like this in a city this size? Bankers here are clear-eyed and practical, the same as bankers elsewhere, possibly more so. Why, oh why, would financial genius go for sidewalk restaurants, benches, fountains, trees, flowers? They know the people of Rochester, that's why. Quality people in quality jobs, earning quality incomes, buy quality merchandise. The stability of the workforce in Rochester makes for stability of investments in Rochester. From all over the world. Winter comes, the crows move into downtown. Um, they hang out in the trees, they get a little crazy, and people react in a completely ridiculous way. They were so over the top about these crows. You know, these crows, they're universal. I mean, it don't matter if you are black or gay or straight or whatever the hell you want to call it. If you want to be called Mr. or Ma'am, don't matter. These crows are going to be shitting on you no matter what. Their poop is everywhere and we got to do something about it. If God put me on this earth, I swear to God, now to take care of these crows and that's what I'm going to do. It's hard to believe the crows actually tried to take over this town. The Parks Department really saved this town, I think. Could have been a real, could have been a real, I don't know. I just don't think it would have been in the best interest of the taxpayers' dollars to actually have them here. You know, I'm not gonna pay for that. I gotta work. They did come back this year, but not as much as they used to, so I think they learned. But the great horn owl, so I guess if we have more great horn owls, that would naturally wipe them out, but. The trees are calm now. You wait, you wait, you wait till the nighttime. And they'll be everywhere. They hide now. I think they're scared after what happened. Can't trust these crows, can't trust these people coming in telling us everything's okay, because it ain't okay. We see that, it ain't okay. We gotta take care of this, ourselves. Bird poop, I don't see why it's such a big deal. Um, everybody's washing their hands and, you know. We, we gotta learn to love. They'll be back. They'll be back. When those crows come back, I'll be ready. I'll tell you what, I'll be ready. Come on, Uncle Bo, I'll be ready. I'll be around here again. I'll be ready. It's possible. Many things are possible. But yes, the crows could make a comeback. And when they do, this town may not be ready. I was something to tell the kids, you know? It was... These clothes, I don't like them. They shitting on my soul, shitting on my flow. I don't even know. I'm just trying to be Joe out here with my kids, and then they come and they shit. What do you mean? I ain't never gonna forfeit. So I came outside and I ran really fast to my car, so they couldn't shit on me. I could go out and get to your bar. I need to get respect out here in these streets. When the fucking crows come out here, they kinda like the crow police. So I gotta say, no crows. Crows, crows, watch out. Ornithology, yeah, it's a study of birds. Ah! Ah! Big 